And uh, thanks everybody for attending today. As Ron said, this is going to be our first Ask Me Anything. And what I'd like to do for those of you that might not have attended any one of our previous three webinars with our current guest today, um, I'll start off with Glenn Little. Um, Glenn covered the life cycles and discipline agile and gave an in-depth look at that. And then we went on to Beth Willett. Beth covered um, with me a bit of the discipline agile world and PMI world coming together in what we're currently seeing in the industry. And then we had Lawrence Wood, who is the leader of the Center of Excellence at William Hill, um, a very large scale transformation to discipline agile. Um, so yeah, I'd like to open it up to questions and we'll just let this kind of uh, uh, unfold as far as what questions any one of us can answer or all of us can answer. And it looks like our first question, and, I, and I'm gonna try and pronounce everybody's name as, as best I can. So J Jadesh asks, what are a few things you can share that you would not do on your next transformation? So uh, we, we can all chime in on that, but Lori, I'll ask you to, to, to lead us off with that. Okay, well, the first thing is I wouldn't do face-to-face -face training <laughs> <laughs> because I, I was on a, a bold path to have a thousand people certified by June and that is not going to happen. So, um, yeah, I think, the well, we know the world has changed, training has changed, but a serious, a serious point to my comment is that I, I wouldn't have done big blocks of training I'm now going to do training in little blocks, bite-sized training, because then people can dial in for half an hour or an hour and learn about DA. And we didn't used to do it like that. So that's me. And uh, Glenn, I don't know if you want to add anything with all of the transformation work you've done as well. Um, I think I would, we tried in transformation to sort of do a uh, top down uh, bottom up approach and and I, I agree uh, we've always tried to do transformations incrementally take a couple of teams at a time and and, and roll it out uh, I think then I, certainly I would do things different I don't know whether there are things I would not do but uh, certainly I would put a lot more emphasis on um, getting management on board with uh, transformation early um typically we get buy-in early with with management and then it fades um and you end up you know sort of struggling with trying to get things in because you you lose focus and i think uh you know the next transformation i would work a lot more on keeping that management focus in place for transformation because um you know, I, everybody knows sort of management goes to the next shiny object, right? And you need to make sure that you're the you're that shiny object for a long period of time in order to be successful with transformation. Yeah, and I'll add one thing on that as well, because that that was one of the first things that that popped into my mind is not just um, keeping the focus there, but also getting the opportunity to do some training or some mentoring of the leadership team, so they really understand what's needed, what's going on. Um, sometimes there is a little bit of a disconnect in, in my experience between what somebody in a very senior role might be expecting from an agile transformation and how quickly it might happen or not happen and what's really needed and, and what it really means, right? When they want to accelerate a lot of coverage in a very short period of time and uh, the, the challenges that, that often result with that. Yeah. Um, I, I would agree. And, and I think, you know, making sure that the goals and objectives of management uh, for the transformation are, are kept in line as well. I mean, we, we all know management going in and saying, hey, we need to do this agile stuff so that we can deliver software faster and cheaper, right? Um, we need to make sure that the transformation goals are, are really in keeping with, with what they expect to get out of it. Yeah. Um, Beth, any, anything else uh, that you want to I add? I just want to kind of pull together some of the stuff I heard because it's so true in my experience as well. You've got focus on transformation and teams doing the work, connecting to mid-level and senior management, 
and, and Glenn absolutely agree and have seen the same thing, engaged early on and kind of disappear off to the next thing. And it, I'm reminded of the multiple projects, life cycles that it will take to make this successful. And that communications and stakeholder management is really, a, a you know, it's an effort, a deliverable, an outcome that has to be managed consistently throughout the process with milestones, with goals, with touch points to continue that engagement. Um, so all of that tied together really shows a, a very comprehensive flavor of exactly what we're, we're faced with when we do a transformation. And I'll also read a comment in um, by a uh, upcoming uh, panelist uh, for a future webinar, um, Paul Sim. Identifying your champions at each level of management, we need the support of those people to influence their peers, absolutely. And if they aren't the champions you thought they would be, find new champions in the organization, yes. Um, very good point, uh, uh, Paul. Uh, we have a question from Ed. Hello, Beth. Can you please describe how you think DA and PMI will look like one year from now? So I'll be singing that song uh, from the Pointer Sisters. Do you, well, anybody know what that is? Now. <laughs> we are family. <laughs> <laughs> we are family. So you know, it's interesting. I've uh, through my career and experience, I've been through lots of different mergers and acquisitions, and there's always that, that getting to know you and. And it's like a love club syndrome at the beginning and everything's, you know, joy and apple pie. And then we've got to start really getting some things done. And we're starting to see, you know, some of those challenges of you've got to integrate systems and process and cultures and technology and mindsets and, and content. So we have, we have tremendous things that we are seeing move forward. Mm -hmm. So one year from now, oh, and this is being recorded. Okay. That's right. <laughs> One year from now, I predict that the memberships from DA and PMI will be fully integrated and harmonious. I also predict that the, the content focus of how project managers can weave in and out of Discipline Agile Toolkit to make their world more successful will be very and strongly embraced and received. And I believe on the certification front, we are gonna see a trajectory of continual increase. I guess I have to do it this way for the screen. Continual increase of um, certified discipline agiles, agilist, uh, lean scrum masters, uh, uh, and agile practitioners. I think we're gonna see a tremendous increase like I hope the stock market will continue to improve. I will, I, so certifications, tremendous um, integration and positive where we'll see in a much more intentional way how they support one another, how a PMP supports a certified discipline agilist and how coupled together I as an individual can be much more powerful. I think we'll see the membership benefits that um, was intended on the very onset of this partnership where the content, uh, the rich base of information and the tremendous diversity of community and sharing. I think we'll see that grow. Um, and I just think we're gonna see some brand new relationships, brand new opportunities and tremendous even PMI projects with chapters and even within the PMI that we start to see discipline agile adopted, leverage used to really propel these to a new state that that we probably don't even imagine today. So that's my one year from now view. <laughs> All right, and it looks like another question here for Lori. Um, it's Elaine and the question is, how long do you think it will take for a good amount of your teams to really be doing Agile? Well, it's a bit different. William Hill, it's a little bit different to that. We're already doing Agile. So we have between 70 and 100 teams, and most of them are using Scrum and similar things, Kanban as well. So that, that's one of the reasons we chose DA. We can go into a team and say, carry on doing what you're doing. But um, what, one, of our what, one of our metrics is how many teams can tell us what life cycle they are using. Have they chosen their wow? And do they even understand the question? So we're not trying to 
adopt agile we're trying to put our arms around agile using mm. da if that makes sense i mean mm. i can still ask the question how long will it take well my experience of doing similar things elsewhere is you never finish it's it's there's no destination i actually said to the guiding coalition when we we're trying to align our language that it's an adoption not a transformation and the destination is one of continual improvement and it's easy to say that but that's quite difficult for some people to accept and grasp that but it never finishes um, it takes at least an, a year to make any difference at all in my experience mm -hmm. yeah Glenn I know we were just kind of touching on this uh, post one of the uh, training workshops you you wrapped up delivering and yeah, it's a common question. How long does, does something take? And again, just like we teach um, how you choose your way of working based on your context, it, there's so many things that impact at any given organization and, and down to any any particular team. How long for them to, to potentially start doing an actual agile way of working? And then how long for an organization? It, it, it's it's a journey that, that should never end, especially when we're talking about DA and, and we're always constantly trying to evolve to something that's going to be, you know, more more applicable to what we're trying to accomplish in that next bit of time. I, I think it's a just to add to that though, I, I think it's a bit of a sliding scale. I mean, there is certainly a point at which you can uh, look at a team and saying and say, uh, okay, they've bought in, they're they're working, um, and now they're into not just the initial, okay, we've adopted this and now we're really working at it. Now it's thinking as opposed to going into your guided continuous improvement, right? right. Um, and, I, and I think the question more focuses not on, you know, when are you done as opposed to, so when, when can you really feel that the team has adopted the philosophy, the work, the guide? Um, and, and again, and I'm not going to give you an answer to that just because just because I've simplified the question. <laughs> uh, because again, you know, as as you've said, context counts. But I've certainly seen teams um, that I would say, hey, as a coach, I can back off after six or eight iterations, right? Uh, and hey, we can let these guys go move on their own, and I'll just drop in more periodically. I've also seen teams where you know, ten and twelve iterations in they're struggling just to figure out how do we finish this iteration and, and are toying with, Hey, we need to change our life cycle because, you know, we just can't seem to get this one right. Um, which of course is the wrong approach, right? I mean, you, you always need to, uh, you know, uh, get things right and then decide, Oh, okay. Now what do, is there a way that we can improve and maybe look at, at changing your life cycle at that point, but changing life cycles because you can't get one right. Isn't is never typically the right answer. So. Well, I'm going to lead into one that leads into another question uh, on life cycles from John. What is the best life cycle? <laughs> <laughs> wow, there you go. <laughs> I guess since I did the uh, presentation on life cycles, I should probably at least attempt the first answer on that. And uh, <laughs> I, I go back to the standard. Uh, when I was a consultant, we always used to say depends. Uh, now that we're in the DA, we can say context I can't, so. right? <laughs> um, it obviously depends on, on the context that you're working in. And, um, you know, we typically recommend for a development project uh, that you go with your agile life cycle, uh, but that might not fit. If you're in uh, a typical uh, continuous delivery, then obviously you want to go with the lean life cycle. Um, but and, and if you're not doing software development all at all, then you obviously need to explore the business life cycles that are are now available with this new version of DA. So uh, context counts. Uh, there's certainly uh, no way to to say we are not a one size fits all. Um, just because we have a hammer doesn't mean everything's a nail. Uh, you can put all sorts of different uh, expressions in there, but the bottom line is that you need to go through the process of choosing your way of working and figuring out uh, what's the most appropriate way for you and, and adopt it. Uh, you know, none of this stuff is cast in concrete uh, just because you've decided you want to, um, you know, adopt scrum and, or you've had a mandate that, Hey, we're going to do safe, or we've got a mandate uh, that you're going to do scrum. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the appropriate way for you to be working. So yeah. need to, need to take in a lot of different factors. I think there are about eight or nine factors that we look at when choosing life cycle. 
and I, mm -hmm. I should probably know that number right off the top, but, but it's a, but it's changes depending on your circumstances too. And the one we teach in the uh, choose your way of working uh, is one flow diagram, which looks at, at, at eight, six or eight uh, different factors, but there may be other factors that also influence the way you choose your work. So, yeah. um, you know, keep that in mind. And that's an important part of I me. Mean, we teach that in the DALSM, the Discipline Agile and Scrum Master course, that we've got an example of six tactical scaling attributes that we start to get some, some conversation, some discussion going around so we can move on to picking the best fit life cycle. But as you said, it's not just those six with the sort of varying attributes in each yeah. one of those factors. There are, are many other things we might want to consider based on that team, that organization, um, so lot, lots of things can come into play here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if you're in a non-compliance environment, then there may be other things that do affect you. Um, you know, architectural uh, in, uh, infrastructure, as it, for instance, could have huge impact on you uh, if you're working in a domain that's uh, off the shelf and you're modifying it, as if, for instance, it may affect the way you choose to, to uh, work, work. So, right. Mm -hmm. Lots Lori, Beth, any, any other thoughts on this before we I, I move on to some of the many other questions that we've got? Well, I, I think, um, and I, I sort of peeked at some of the Q&A Q stuff that's coming in. It triggered the thought of really as, as a project management practitioner, a DA practitioner, um, a new DA practitioner that's been a project management practitioner. I, I think when I start with what is important, I think about the principles and you guys mentioned a couple of them context counts right um, being pragmatic at how you approach that because it's not cookie cutter and people are not cookie cutter and so really looking at some of those key principles of what what are we dealing with and and do I have to evolve certain things what do we need to improve upon what can we optimize um, what is the customer focus in that scenario? So I really think about those principles and what's the product that you're building um, to understand those so I can be a principle-based approach when I come into a situation. And then I will use some of these other tools to guide toward the proper selection, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you guys said all that, but the principles really resonated with me as you were talking. Yeah. I would agree. In looking at that, I, I had to think about, I was, I was glad you took that question first because I had to think about, okay, what are the most essential skills? Um, and uh, so I had to think about it a bit and, and certainly being open uh, and being willing to uh, try and explore. Um, often people, when we, when, because we use the term choose your way of working, people think in terms of that's it. That's it. Once we've made the choice, then we're locked in. And I think you need to take a bit of a step back and take a more of a lean approach with, okay, we're going to do an experiment and we're going to try this way of working. Um, it gives people a little bit more openness. It doesn't feel like they're, they're locked in that, oh, we've made the final choice. Yeah. And from here on in, this is the only thing we can do. Um, so going and it's kind of a, that willingness to, it's okay if it's not perfect the first time out because we're going to improve on it. Yep. yep. And, it, and it's, and in the long run, it's, it's okay to fail, right? I mean, obviously you want to succeed more than you fail uh, in order to make progress. Um, but it's okay to try something and say, you know what, this isn't for us. That's what choice of your, uh, is all about, right? Choice mm -hmm. is good. Choice is good. And yeah, and the question. I'm trying um, to go back to your principles, Beth. They're <laughs> <laughs> <Her> principles, <laughs> but thank that we're you. answering is from Auntie, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it. So, Auntie, I appreciate you coming today and asking, in your opinion, what are the most essential skills that practitioners and members of DAPMI should possess or strive for? So, as we're answering all these, and, and what I'll I'll pile on top of what you both have already covered is also we, we do teach the four views of discipline agile, right? So we have people, we have practices, and we have flow. And then like the underpinning of all that is the mindset. And, and that's a lot of times what I like to focus on is, is having an open mind, right? Especially if you're coming from a more prescriptive type of approach, or you've been in a situation where, yes, something's been mandated and you are 
needing to be in compliance with some form of a, of a more heavyweight governance approach. And it just, you know, so you're doing things that don't add value and you're kind of stuck in that and coming over into the DA space and realizing that, yes, you, you can make choices and then you can, you, you don't live with those choices forever. You're constantly looking to, to uh, improve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question for, from Robert and the question, Lori, it looks like for you, how hard is it to find team level coaches that, that really know what they're doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's quite hard to find anybody who really knows what they're doing. Um, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. What I mean is there's a lot of competition for good people in, out there. And I'm, and I'm thinking fairly generally across the cities that I've worked in, which is at the moment is, is, is around Europe. So yeah, coach, the questions about coaching specifically, um, I haven't got a, solid answer i think that i'm starting to find that coaching is a skill not a role maybe and i think within da there's a lot of guidance deep in the book but also some specific education about coaching but perhaps what i've learned is don't assume that that's just for your coaches because right. i'm looking to delivery people to coach and leaders to coach and there's a lot of good stuff in there servant leadership etc so that, that would be my thought is think of coaching as a as a, an endeavor not as a hat that you wear mm -hmm. yeah I, I i would completely agree um it, i guess if you're I, I would and and in keeping with that i would suggest you look internally for your coaches because you've got people who already understand your culture and and understand your products and so if you can look internally to those that have that skill set to coach, uh, then promoting those people or moving those people or, and, and there are a lot of people who make great coaches and, and in fact do coaching on a day-to-day -day basis, but don't get recognized for it uh, within an organization. And if you can, uh, if, if you're managing the transformation, if you can recognize those people and make those people your champions, then, then you're way ahead of the game. Uh, with regards to your transformation. But if you're actually looking to hire a coach, um, then it's a different situation because, um, and I would suggest you do like you do in Lean, where you experiment. Um, bring people in for short periods of time and see whether or not they're compatible. Uh, I've had some excellent coaches who have gone in uh, to situations that it just, they just didn't jive with the team right? It just mm -hmm. didn't work for whatever reason. And yet in other places, they've been excellent. So it's a really context does count. Um, and in, in particular, when you're looking at uh, people skills, it's very difficult to, to find people who's going to uh, uh, actually jive, really uh, jive with your team and, and work with your team. Um, years ago, uh, when I got hired at, at a company uh, in the US, I had a month long interview. They actually, we did two tele, three telephone interviews and then they brought me down and said, okay, we want you to work with the team for a month. And then we're at the end of the month, we're gonna evaluate whether or not you're working with the team and people like you and you can get along with the team and you're bringing us the right message. So, you know, that's certainly, uh, and uh, as a result, I was there 17 years. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so just, uh, you know, it works, uh, you know, try it, you know, do an experiment, try things out, find out whether or not people are, are, are going to work for you. Don't, don't make commitments, uh, like that. So, cause, uh, it is when it comes to people skills, uh, you know, it's, it's important to get the right fit and coaching really, no matter how much, whether they bring the technical knowledge or not. They really need to have the people skills in order to get the people to do the work, right? They're not there to do the work. They're there to get the people to work. I often use the expression when I'm a coach is I'm not really here to do anything. I'm just here to get you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have another question. Um, as a PMP for seven plus years, why would I want to add discipline agile to my certification portfolio? Well, if you're content with where you are and what you're doing, I would say don't bother. But if you're one of those kinds of people who want to continue to grow and learn and improve on what you do and be excellent in your field, you have access to a new toolkit that can really raise the bar on 
what you do, how you deliver, how you influence teams. And um, it's really powerful. So I, I chose to do it, as you guys all know, <laughs> having been in that uh, way more than seven plus years. Um, but I, there's just so much richness and so much content that you can improve whatever area of your program or project or even portfolio that you want to tweak up a little bit. And so it's, it's just really going to bring, I, I, I was told by somebody not to say bag of tricks, but I would say learn the skills, put them in your bag, pull them out when you need them. It's really adding to your toolkit, frankly. Um, and, and I think you'll find if you are an experienced project manager already, you'll find that if you're a logical thinker, you've been thinking in a pragmatic way. You've been looking at context and assessing what's appropriate to use and adopt for that context. Um, and I think you'll find that you'll connect to so many things already as you learn about Discipline Agile, that it's just gonna make sense. And it will not only enrich your team and your work, but your career path as well. Yeah, I um, I was fortunate to, um, uh maybe six weeks ago now, um, do a train the trainer session for a group of candidate trainers in India. And I, unfortunately, I can't remember the gentleman's name who's the, the head of, of um, PMI India. And he led off the, the initial kickoff of this training with a statement that said, agility is one of the new currencies of business and led down into that and why there were so many you know, people interested in becoming trainers as, as well as why there's a need for so many trainers and just the, the, the awareness and the interest of learning not only an agile way of working, but now learning um, discipline agile. So yeah, that, 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 that statement has stuck with me since then. That was a, a very positive message. Let's see, we are almost out of time, but I'd like to get to at least one more question that we have here. And um, this question, Lori, again, it looks like it's a little bit for, for you, but maybe we can all pile in. What worked despite you thinking it had a low probability, a long shot per se? <laughs> Interesting one. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe that brings me back to, if I'm honest about remote training, which is very topical. I always, I'm, I'm my style when I'm, I don't coach so much now, but when I used to coach and teach, I'm a very hands-on post-it notes sort of person and would always try and not use PowerPoint even. But in the new world, that is not really going to work for at least the next few months and I believe probably longer. So I think what has surprised me is how effective you can be remotely. And Josh, Josh knows all about that because that's what he does. But um, yeah, so that, that's perhaps what's, what's surprised me, that we, we can be effective remotely. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that, that has been a surprise for a lot of people that have recently come to virtual live instruction um, you know, training courses, as well as organizations that I've, I've either worked with or now working with that um, I historically had been working on site. I, I would come in for a period of time and, and now showing them the things I've been saying, hey, we can be very effective if we do some of this remotely. And it's, it, again, it's more cost effective. I can meet with multiple teams pretty seamlessly one after the next. So there, there, that's a, a, a very positive outcome of just the, the terrible things that COVID have brought that there is a good awareness of, of being able to do things in a virtual live format, whether it's training or coaching or, or uh, teams working with each other. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have a few more questions, um, and uh, what we'll do is we can answer those, and we'll put out a blog entry on these. Um, there, Glenn, there are a few more on just life cycles, so we can um, have Glenn do maybe a little bit of a, a write-up on that. I want to thank... Beth and Glenn and Lori for not only your individual webinars, um, but just coming back today and being able to answer all of these questions. Um, really great for the for the community. Much appreciated. Good to be here. And Thank you. we will not have a webinar next week. We will um, resume on, I believe it's the third. Yes, it's the third. And we will have Paul Sims and Rod Bray. And we are going to be talking about um, how do you know what good looks like? Um, 
So we've got some interesting thoughts there. I've actually, some, that's something I've been talking to Glenn a bit about lately, because uh, it keeps coming up by students in uh, um, classes, as well as um, organizations that I've, I've been working with. So uh, that will be on June 3rd, and uh, we appreciate uh, everybody attending today.